Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about an introduction to kinetics and what is called the collision theory. Now, kinetics is the study of the speed of a chemical reaction. Uh, back in pre-P chemistry, we kind of assumed that first off, all reactions take place, and we never really talked about how quickly they're taking place. Um, that's going to change now that we're in AP chemistry. Um, next unit, we're going to talk about what is uh, called delta G or Gibbs energy, uh, which addresses the idea of thermodynamic favorability, whether or not a reaction will occur at a given set of conditions. But in this unit, we're going to talk about how quickly that reaction is taking place if it is in fact thermodynamically favorable. Um, so there's three key questions that we're going to try to answer during the course of this unit. Uh, first off, what is the rate at which the reactants are converted into products? So basically the speed of the reaction, and there's various ways that we can calculate that and so we'll talk about all kinds of different mathematical processes that we can do to figure out the answer to that right question. Uh, we're going to also talk about what factors influence the rate of reaction. What can I do to speed up or slow down a reaction? And then we're also going to talk about the sequence of steps, the mechanism by which the reactants are converted into products. Um, what order do things need to collide in in order for us to create those products? Products. Um, so like I said, as we go through this unit, we're going to be answering all three of those questions. Um, for right now, what we're first going to talk about is what is called the collision theory. Uh, the collision theory addresses what has to happen in order for a reaction to take place in the first place. And there's three statements to this theory. Uh, the first of those is kind of the obvious one in the fact that molecules must collide in order for reaction to occur. If we want to create products, we're going to have to get the reactants to interact with each other. And most of the time we do two particles colliding at one time. It's very hard to get three or more particles to collide with enough energy and in the right orientation. Um, and so most of the time we're just kind of doing two at a time. Now if a reaction does involve more than two particles, then that's where a mechanism would be involved. What kind of order would we need to collide in in order to get us to products? So the second part to the theory says, hey, molecules must collide with sufficient energy in order for reaction to occur. And this term hopefully is going to sound familiar to those of y'all who took pre-AP, um, and that is activation energy. What is the minimum energy that you must overcome in order for those reactants to convert into products? And back in pre-AP, we looked at diagrams that look like this. These are what are called a potential energy diagram. And we looked at these from the idea of identifying endo and exothermic reactions, comparing the reactants and the products to see if heat overall was lost or gained. For example, here, as reactants changed into products, uh, we lost potential energy and it got released as heat, as kinetic energy, and that release of heat would indicate that we had an exothermic reaction here. However, we actually care in this unit, in kinetics, more about the activation energy amount. This amount I have to get over in order to work my way over here to products. That activation energy is basically how much oomph things have to collide with in order to get to the product side. Remember that part of the goal in creating those products is that we first have to break the bonds that are present before I can reform new ones. So we've got to hit with enough oomph to break those bonds. Remember, it takes to break bonds. And so then that way, once they're broken, then we can reform them in a new configuration and release that energy. So that's why you always see these graphs go up, then down. It takes to break those bonds and it frees when we reform the new bonds. Uh, now, up at the top of this, we have what is called the activated complex. And the activated complex is sometimes called a transition state. It's basically kind of a temporary point where all the bonds have been broken in what we had originally, but we haven't yet reformed them into a new configuration. That transition point exists for a very short period of time. You notice here, uh, a less than a fraction of a second, we're talking 10 in the negative 13 seconds that we're here at this transition state. So the transition to reactants to products is pretty fast, and we're at this transition state for a very minimal amount of time. 
Um, it says here that activation energy can be noted both on a potential energy diagram, which is this guy right here, um, but also on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. I know you thought you were done with these lovely curves, right? It's been a while since we talked about these since gas loss. Um, so just as a reminder of what we're seeing here is that this happens to be a sample at a particular temperature, and we are showing the distribution of particles at what energy amount they have. So as kind of a reminder, right around where the peak is is usually kind of the approximate average temperature of that substance, but you're always going to have particles that are moving slower than that and particles that are moving faster than that. So imagine you have this range of particle speeds that are happening in your sample. Only some of those particles are going to have enough energy to get over that activated complex there, to make the transition from reactants to products. And so only molecules that have enough activation energy, so these ones in gray here, would have sufficient energy in order to do a collision that could actually produce product. The rest of these collisions would be unsuccessful because they don't have enough energy to break the bonds. They don't have enough oomph to get them going. Okay. All right. There's one more point to our collision theory. And that is that molecules must collide in the correct orientation. Um, keep in mind that if I'm trying to make a new bond between two substances, I kind of need those two substances to interact with each other. If they don't collide in such a way to interact with each other, then I'm not going to end up producing product. Um, so for example, this particular picture is actually trying to show this reaction right here, diatomic A and diatomic B making two molecules of AB. So if I want A and B to be bonded to each other in these two new molecules, I need the A and B to interact in the collisions. Otherwise, a bond can't form between them. So on this first collision here, what's happening is, is that A and B hit, the A and the B from each of these molecules can interact with each other, which means as, as those bonds break and we have enough energy to break them, as they reform, we can make those new bonds between A and B. However, here, even if these are hitting with enough energy, the problem is, is that this exterior A and B on either side are not having any interaction with each other. And remember, I need a bond to form between those. So since there's no interaction that takes place there, we can't form that new bond. And if that bond can't form, then the other one isn't allowed to form either. And so you can see these collisions uh, between these two molecules would end up not having Happening. So while this was a good orientation, the second orientation was not. So here's what I want us to understand. In order for a reaction to occur, you have to hit with enough energy and in the right orientation. If one of those two components is missing, just because the molecules collide does not mean they're going to transition over to making product. So here's the deal. Anything that we can do to help this process along would end up speeding up our reaction. So first off, if we can do something to increase just the sheer frequency of collisions, how many collisions are occurring, then obviously, even if the same percentage of collisions are successful, having more collisions overall would ensure that there would be more successful collisions. Uh, the energy of the collisions would help tremendously if I can do something to speed up those molecules and ensure that they hit with enough oomph, then that would help us to have a greater percentage of successful collisions. And then finally, if we can do anything to help the orientation of those collisions, if we can help them to come together in just the right fashion so that they can bond with each other easily, that would help to speed up our reaction. So here's what we're going to do. In my playlist, I'm going to put a cute video that talks about impacting the three of these factors um, in terms of getting a date. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it really does help us to kind of get an understanding of what we can do to speed up these reactions. All right, hopefully you're feeling good about the collision theory. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.